Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, brought to you by loserpool.com and with me, Harry Simiou. On this week's edition, we'll be talking about that Granite Xhaka interview. We'll be talking about the international break, Arsenal's warm weather training camp in Dubai and the friendly that took place today. We'll also be looking ahead to the game with Newcastle United on Monday night and we'll be going wherever else the conversation takes us. Now, before we get deep into the conversation, uh, I want to bring your attention to a competition that we're going to be running over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and you have the opportunity to win a chanting Arsenal scarf. Yep, that's right. The scarf sings. It comes with a voice unit and it plays some of your favorite Arsenal chants. And that is courtesy of the 12th men.com. Uh, their information will be in the description of this podcast. All you need to do is follow us. Follow them, retweet the tweet that we're going to be putting out shortly after this show. And uh, yeah, you'll be in with a shout of winning this wonderful prize. And we've got two of them up for grabs, which means two of you will be uh, receiving these brilliant scarves in the post. I also have to tell you that they are fantastic quality, brilliant stuff, and they are packaged ready to be given as a gift as well. So if you want to try and win one for one of your friends or family, uh, it's, a, it's a great competition to enter. Like I said, it's really simple. All you've got to do is follow us, follow the 12 men, retweet it, uh, and you're in with a chance of winning. And also, the sound modules uh, are removable. So if you decide that you do just want the scarf when you're out and about because it's a little bit lighter, that's absolutely fine. You can remove the sound module. Uh, so yeah, um, you know, when I heard about them, I was like, yeah, this sounds great. And I've had a couple sent over to us uh, for this competition and I've, I've had a good look at them and they are brilliant gifts, uh, especially if uh, you've got friends and family that are also gooners. Let's get some housekeeping out of the way. If you haven't already subscribed, please do hit that subscribe button. If you're listening on iTunes, please, please, please leave us a review. And if you're listening via YouTube too, uh, please do subscribe there. If you haven't already, hit that like button. We're very close to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, and we're very proud of that. Uh, we are an audio podcast, so to get uh, even close to that number is brilliant, uh, and we're super proud. So thank you for all your continued support. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, of course, at Chronicle underscore AFC. You know, you know the draw by now, guys. Come on. Joining me in the studio this week is Mike Stavrou, TalkSport and Love Sport Radio producer. Welcome back, mate. How are you? What's up, Harry? How are you doing, man? Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Uh, you know how it is. Uh, keeping busy uh, and uh, glad the international break's over, to be honest with you. Oh, uh, I can't stand it. You know that. <laughs> I, can't, I actually can't stand international football it helps that England are a bit better at the moment but still as a as a generic thing you know and especially what annoys me is that it's so close to the end of the season like we're all getting hyped up where are we going to finish the title race what's going to happen who's going to get relegated and then you've got a rele- and then you've got the international break it just puts a real spanner in the it works does. doesn't it but the, the good downer. side of it um, I suppose if you're married and you've got a kid then it gives you a chance to spend some time with them without being in the doghouse uh, yeah. for a weekend. So it's nice in that sense, but I totally get what you mean. It's, it's too close to the end of the season for me. Things are just starting to heat up and then it stops abruptly. But before we talk about the international break, uh, the big debate this week has been regarding Granit Xhaka and some comments that he made in an interview. Uh, I know you've got the comments in front of you, Mike, and, and there was one comment in particular uh, that's really got some of our fans' backs up. And, and I not really sure why go on if you want to just share the quote yeah so he came out and said I'm very ambitious I want to take the next step um, Arsenal does not have to be the last stop so what did you make of those quotes were you as pissed off as some because some people have really been going in on him about this you know what um, I think it was done in another language I think so these things can always be taken out of context and I just think as the media, and we do it, you know, everyone does it, we read into people's comments too much. Like there was one that came out uh, with Pogba the other week where he was saying it would be a dream to play for, for Real Madrid, um, but I'm happy at Man United. And Man United fans took that and they went crazy. And it's a similar thing here. The only thing is, Granit Xhaka isn't Paul Pogba and he's not Cristiano Ronaldo in the making. So looking at the comments and he's saying Arsenal doesn't have to be the last stop. I see why people are getting upset because to be honest, 
for me, he's only really been good for the last six months or so. At the beginning of the season, everyone was on his back. Last season, he was probably one of the most you know antagonistic players. So for him to come out and already be too big for his boots, I think that's why people got annoyed. And I, I can see that, to be honest. The, the, the thing with me, though, is that it's not outrageous for a player to say that the current club he's with, particularly at Granite Xhaka's age, may not be the last club he plays for. And I think when you put it into context, and I know it's kind of different because these guys are heroes, but when you think about Thierry Henry, Patrick Vieira, these players all moved on, didn't they? And these players are still regarded as Arsenal legends. So it's not inconceivable that a player is going to move on somewhere else. And you know, these people like Granit Xhaka, for example, they're not Arsenal fans. Granit Xhaka has no affiliation to Arsenal other than the fact that he plays for them at the moment. He's not a fan like us. So for me, it's kind of, it's not something that people want to hear, but I think the reaction's been a little bit over the top. And we put out a poll on this, actually, on our, our podcast uh, Twitter feed. A hundred people voted in this. And the question was, ahead of this week's podcast, I want to know how you feel Ari Xhaka's recent interview uh 10% said outraged and 90% said not fussed about it but looking at the meltdown on twitter yeah you wouldn't think those numbers... i think the caveat harry is that you were mentioning players like honoree and vieira who went and fabregas obviously went on to bigger clubs jaka is not that kind of player so i think the way that some fans took it was like he's not really in a position to be saying that because as i said for me even though he's like one of our most improved players I still don't think he's proved his worth, to be honest. Like, we, we bought him from Gladbach. Uh, he was, you know, fairly highly rated, but he wasn't, you know, blowing the world apart. He wasn't setting the world alight. So, you know, really, by comments asked him, we've raised his profile. And for him to be, like, looking on already is still... I think that's the reason why people are upset. Do you not think, though, Granit Xhaka has a right to feel aggrieved by some of the treatment that he's had from certain sections of our support? And do you think that that could have uh, influenced his comments? Do you think that he maybe thinks that Arsenal's not going to be his home forever because he can't seem to get the fans on his side, no matter what he does? I think he has recently. I think people have started, even though he still does divide opinion. I mean, for me, as someone who tries as best I can to look at the game without my rose tinted glasses on, um, and as objectively as possible, even I have said, you know, even I was a big critic that he has improved. And I think if you watch his performances on the pitch, he's been so much better. So I think fans will have to have some incredible bias against him to say that he hasn't improved. Uh, but I think, you know, any player is going to get stick if, if they're rubbish. I mean, that's just part of football. That's part of social media now. You know, if you're not very good, then the fans will get on your back. And I think any player just has to learn to deal with that. So no, I don't think he can feel greed. I think that's just part of football. Fair play, fair play. I've also read lots of comments um, from people regarding this saying things like, you know, uh, we should get rid of him, kick him out. We've got Genduzi, we've got Torreira. But people seem to be missing the fact that in this interview, he did also say that he's very happy at Arsenal. It, it kind of feels like people just pick quotes. You know, a couple of big Twitter accounts will pick selected quotes. They'll put them out and people will go mad over him without actually reading the entire interview. And that is something that gets on my nerves. But what I will say as well in Granit Xhaka's defence is, you know, we can say that he's not in a position to say things like that. But for me, Granit Xhaka is Arsenal's most important central midfield player. And the fact that he's the one that's picked the most by Unai Emery, he's the one Even that was... more Lucas Torreira, you reckon? Yeah, I do. I do honestly believe that. I think if you look at this season, and I know it's Torreira's first season, but he's been left out a lot more times than Granit Xhaka's been left out when available. And I think that Unai Emery really, really values this player. I think Arsene Wenger really, really valued him before him. I think Switzerland really, really value him. They've made him the captain, if I'm not mistaken. So there's something about this guy that managers buy into. And maybe as fans, we're missing something. Is it that he trains well? Is it, is it that his attitude's good? Is it that he's popular in the dressing room? There is some part of Granit Xhaka, for me, that the majority of our fan base seems to, to miss and not see because he's very, very popular amongst everybody he's worked with. Yeah, I think we're starting to see, Harry, that people change, as I said. I think the things that he really 
really suffered with was um, his his ability to take the ball and distribute it quickly and under pressure get out of those situations. And I don't know what it is about Emery, but he couldn't seem to do that on, under Wenger. And even like the first, I don't know, 10 games of this season, I remember he, he was dropped for a few games, wasn't he? And I think that might have just lighted a fire inside of him and said to him, as should all players, you're not undroppable. And even though you know he might be a fantastic trainer and he's been lauded by uh, by both of our, our managers of late, um, he's not, as I said, indis- he's indispensable, like a lot of the players should be. But I think what he's done, as I said, he's become a, a lot more um, laid back and less reckless now. And those were his main two thoughts. Uh, giving the ball away when he was under pressure, he used to give it away all the time. I remember seeing a stat... Um, Earlier on in my days when I was ranting and I was using my stats against Xhaka, that's the one where I think he gave away um, more passes le- directly leading to goals than any player in the Premier League. And the fact that he's transformed that just says, you know, he's added that to the good parts of his game, which are his passing um, and his vision. And now he can add that and he's really becoming a complete player. So I, still, I, I don't know. I don't get what people's points are when they say he's, he's still not good. I don't, I don't understand that. For me, with Granit Xhaka, and, and, and I get a lot of criticism on social media because it feels like I'm always having to defend Granit Xhaka. My point has always been that Granit Xhaka has got plenty of faults. There's lots of areas that he needs to improve in. But when you compare him to the rest of the players that we have at Arsenal, he is head and shoulders above them in terms of his importance to the team. You know, as good as Matteo Genduzzi is, he's a 19-year-old kid. Lucas Torreira is going to need longer to settle in the Premier League. I thought when he first came into the team, he started like a house on fire. I feel as those performances have dropped off a little bit. And so when I say how important I think Granit Xhaka is, it's not because I think he's the best midfield player in the world. Absolutely not. I think there are 10 central midfielders in the world, if not more, that are much better than Granit Xhaka, that would be much better suited to that role. But when you look at what Arsenal and Unai Emery have at their disposal, for me, he is crucial he's to that team. He's the best of a lot, isn't he, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but ideally, we do want someone... Um, who can play alongside Torreira, who's, you know, a bit more of a big physical presence and um, can carry the ball as well, because that's Xhaka's one big fall. He's not got much, much pace, so on the counter-attack, he's not much help, and he's quite reckless. And also, in terms of carrying the ball forward, I mean, he can do it, but it's not his best asset. So I think that should be an area we should look to bring someone for. I think the future of Arsenal is Torreira and Guendouzi. Is it ready yet? No, probably not. But I think looking towards, you know, what we might become in the next few years, as well as some young players coming in, I think that's what it will be. Yeah, absolutely. So just, I mean, just to round off on the, the whole Granite Xhaka debate, um, you know, on a scale of one to 10, one being the lowest, one being not bothered and 10 being fuming, how outraged were you when you read this interview? No, I wasn't outraged. I mean, as we were saying earlier, Harry, it is basically the job of the media to take things out of context. That's just what we do in every scenario. Um, so, no, I wasn't outraged. I'd say it was probably like a, like a three out of ten on the or outrage scale. Yeah, I, I was honestly a zero. I yeah. honestly did not even flinch when I read that. Um, and it was only when I saw the meltdown on Twitter from obviously the Arsenal Twitter sphere, as they call it, and, uh, you know, certain journalists and things that I felt it was worth talking about on this week's show. Um, I, I'd, we'd like to hear what you guys think as well, though. Tweet us at Chronicles underscore AFC. Uh, let us know your thoughts on this particular subject. Like I said, the poll uh, said that 90% of our fans uh, or of our listeners anyway, were, were not fussed by it, but there has been a huge reaction to it. So um, for those of you who are, pissed off about it to put it politely I'd like to know why and hear your thoughts on it joining me on the line now is football writer Harry De Cosimo he's also a Newcastle United fan so we thought who better uh, to help us look ahead to Monday night's Premier League clash between our beloved Arsenal and Newcastle United Harry welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna my friend how have you been I'm good thanks Harry how are you Uh, thank you very much for having me back on no problem at all. We're, we're good as well. We're good uh, just sitting here uh, recording uh, this week's show and, and getting into some debate, uh, of course, as usual. Now, Harry, what can we expect from Newcastle United? I mean, they've been in pretty good form of late. It looks as though they've uh, avoided relegation. Uh, I know it's not obviously completely over, but it looks as though they've done enough. Uh, there have been some really good performances of late. Miguel Almiron's come in. We're in for a tough time on Monday night, are we not? 
I guess uh, you could say yes, but also Newcastle haven't been great on the road. Uh, that's been the expense of their great home form in 2019. Five wins on the bounce at St James's Park, but um, some pretty frustrating times on the road. West Ham uh, was a dismal performance. Wolves um, threw away three points in the last seconds. Uh, Tottenham um, defeat there as well. So it's going to be tough for Arsenal. Newcastle will make it uh, tough in that regard. They'll they'll sit deep and they'll you know five at the back, wing backs uh, potentially, or um, and and that they'll make it tough. But um, the the away form hasn't been great, and Arsenal are superb at home. So. Uh, there won't be too many people, even in the Newcastle camp, backing a, an away victory, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, for me, it always worries me when teams come to the Emirates and, and sit back and are as disciplined as Newcastle United will be, as a Rafa Benitez side will be. Now, I want to touch on a few players uh, that you guys have got in your ranks that have impressed this season. I want to talk about the youngster, Longstar. First of all, will it be available? And uh, what has he brought to the team this season? Uh, Longstaff won't be available. He's not fit. He's um, still recovering from quite a serious knee injury uh, that he picked up at the West Ham game. So that'll be uh, potentially another six, six, seven, eight weeks. Uh, wow, as long as that. Yeah, it's, 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 it, he, he's not going to be featuring in this game. Um, but to be honest, he's been he's been a revelation. Not many people expected it, including Rafa Benitez himself, who's admitted that there wasn't. Um, much of an opportunity for him in the first half of the season. He came in against Liverpool for his debut and uh, didn't look back since. He he was going up against some very, very good teams, uh, particularly that Man City game, which I guess is where the wider public um, got to see what he was all about. He's got something of the Michael Carrick about, about him, which is something quite very impressive for Newcastle supporters because there's a lot of bitterness towards the club and the situation that, that somehow Michael Carrick escaped uh, the northeast to never play for us. So, um, if if he can have half the career of Carrick, then he's going to have a he's going to have a blinding career. But um, keeping his feet on the ground, obviously, this injury has uh, put a stop to his meteoric rise, as it was. Um, hopefully, he's got a big future, uh, both for Newcastle and potentially for England as well. You never know. Yeah, Harry, you've um, finally, finally broken your your, your transfer record uh, after Michael Owen, after God knows how many years, to bring in Miguel Alma on uh, the Paraguayan. How's he been so far for you guys and what potential danger could he pose to Arsenal? He has been nothing short of superb despite not scoring a goal, really. I think um, just the way, the manner in which he's he's changed the whole, the whole team, there's much more of a threat in the... In the final third from Newcastle, Perez and Rondon look much better now than they were in the first half of the season. They were looked a lot more isolated. He's very good at running with the ball at his feet, which means that Newcastle will be much more of a threat on the counter-attack as well. Um, as I say, he probably needs a goal to really settle the uh, settle the nerves and, and make sure that the critics don't creep in because you know what it's like when that when goals don't fly in uh, with, statist- with statist- statisticians and, and everything like that. But to be honest, um, he's been he's been a bit of a revelation. He's the reason, one of the main reasons, along with the likes of Longstaff, that Newcastle have been able to pull away from the relegation battle. So um, yeah, he he's going to be a massive threat, probably the biggest threat on the night, just because he can carry the ball and and run at the heart of your of your defence. And it's thirteenth in the table, uh, thirty five points, a big improvement from the beginning of the season, uh, Harry. At this stage, you know, it probably looks like you're safe. What kind of motivation do you think Newcastle will have coming into a game like this? Do you think it will be a bit of a gimme for them away at Arsenal? Or what kind of what kind of plan do you think they'll come to the Emirates with? It's a free hit for Newcastle. That's the way Newcastle have, have tended to go for these games. And there's a running theme in terms of the results of these kind of games. Losing by a goal to the top sides away from home. Everyone but Liverpool. 2-1 at Chelsea. 2-1 at Man City. 3-2 at Arsenal, at uh, Manchester United, sorry, 1-0 at Tottenham. So um, they'll they'll sit they'll sit deep and, and and try and get as much as they can out of the game. But it'll be a free hit. Interestingly, uh, there's a quite a bizarre sort of um, quirk with the table now. We've got exactly the same uh, points, wins, draws, goal difference, goals, everything to this point last season. Um, so and th- at this point last season, the next game we we won at Leicester to get thir- to go up to thirty eight points and then beat 
funnily enough, you guys to get over 40. So that's the aim for Rafa Benitez. He wants to get to the 40 points. So until that that, to- that target's reached, he'll not sit sit down and, and think any game's a gimme. Um, but I think, yeah, it'll be a bit of a free hit for Newcastle, to be honest. And Harry, do you expect them to line up with a back five then? Like you said, will it be uh, a back five with Richie at, at wing back? He's, he's been a bit of a revelation there, hasn't he? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the other the interesting thing is the second half against um, Everton, he did, Rafa did change it to four at the back to match Everton in midfield, which was a big talking point before the game uh, because obviously that was a game where there, there were a few injuries around the team as well. So I'm not sure whether... It's not as given. If you'd asked me this question three or four weeks ago, I'd have said it's an absolute certainty. But um, I would, I would back five at the back against a team like Arsenal away from home. I think with Richie at left back, yeah, he's been superb. Obviously, he got the equalising goal against Bournemouth uh, last last time out as well, which was great. But um, yeah, I would say five at the back. But Richie and uh, yeah, then do offer quite a lot of um, quite a lot of width and, and good attacking uh, flow, and they allow. As I said, Perez and Almi are on to get in behind and closer to Rondon. So, Harry, in terms of a prediction, I'm going to ask you to stick your neck out on the line now and give us your prediction for Monday's game. Uh, well, um, there's a, as I say, there's a bit of a, a correlation going with these games, so I think it'll be by a goal. I think, but I don't see Newcastle getting anything out of it. I think it'll you, we'll we'll run you run you close, but I think it'll be a, a one nil or a two one, something like that. Um, I don't think that Newcastle will um, will be beaten heavily here, but uh, yeah, I don't see a, I don't see anything other than a defeat. Well, let's hope you're right from an Arsenal perspective, anyway, Harry. Uh, thank you very much for joining me uh, once again. Um, do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media and keep up with the excellent work you do? Uh, Harry recently done a re- really good exclusive with Jonas Gutierrez, and if you're a football fan, you will enjoy that. You don't have to be a necessarily a Newcastle fan uh, to enjoy that piece. I certainly enjoyed it. Harry, where can people find that and uh, all your latest work? Yeah, that's that's my pinned tweet on Twitter. So you'll see that as soon as you find my uh, account at Harry DeCosmo. And that's really the best place to uh, to find me wherever you're looking, really. Just Twitter. Great stuff. And we'll include Harry's Twitter handle in the description of this podcast uh, for easy access. Uh, Harry, we'll uh, speak to you again soon. And uh, thanks for joining me. No problem. Thanks very much, Harry. See you later. That was the brilliant Harry de Cosimo, football writer and, of course, Newcastle United fan there to assist us in looking ahead to that one. Uh, He thinks it will be an Arsenal victory, but a narrow victory. Uh, Just before we move on, Mike, your your prediction for that one on Monday night? Yeah, uh, I think it will be slightly wider, the margin, to be fair. I think we've uh, played ourselves into form recently and we're going to be quite confident. uh, So I reckon about 3-0 there. Okay, interesting. I'm going to go with Um, 2-0. I've watched a couple of Newcastle games uh, closely lately when I've been doing commentary demos and I happened to get two Newcastle games. One was the defeat at Stamford Bridge and the other one was the defeat at West Ham and they they were um, quite unfortunate, I would say, in both those games, defended with a lot of discipline, a lot of steel um, and were probably unfortunate to lose both of those games. So I think it will be tough. Um, I think maybe, you know, one goal margin is, is... Maybe not what I'd go for. Probably I'd say two. Um, You said three. I said two. Harry says one. We're in the middle. Um, So we'll see how that goes. Um, But the next thing I want to talk about is this warm weather training that Arsenal have been doing in Dubai. They've gone out there um, for a training camp. They've been doing some work out there. Uh, They've been obviously going around Dubai, doing some touring. They they met up with the Sheikh yesterday, uh, went to his palace and things like that. So there's obviously a lot of commercial... um, thinking going into this whole thing and then they finished today uh, at the time of recording with a friendly against Al Nazir uh, Arsenal winning 3-2 despite going a goal down um, and Al Nazir interestingly have Alvaro Negredo in their team uh, that's a player who kind of disappeared off the radar but what do you make of this whole going off in the middle of the season and playing friendlies I get the warm weather training part the friendly for me is a bit you know, it's a bit risky, isn't it? And Ozil played, Lacazette played, uh, Suarez played, Leno was in, Mustafi was in. W- what do you make of this whole idea of going off in the middle of the season and playing a friendly? 
I mean, I was having a go at the internationals, Harry. I mean, a minute ago. So the fact that they're actually playing a friendly, which means absolutely nothing other than commercial value. I mean, imagine on that Al Nasser team if there's a Spurs fan and he see, he sees Mess Erzu, he's like, you know what, I'm going to break his leg. <laughs> Is you know what I mean? Like, it, it could happen. I'm not saying it will happen, but it could happen that that Erzu gets injured or somewhat Lacazette gets injured. Even worse, at the most pivotal time of our season, it's just brainless. And obviously, it's all for commercial impact. I get that they're making a lot of money. They're going around taking loads of pictures, and it does well for them on the money side. But on the football inside, like it would be tragic if something like that happened. And I understand it, but. It's just modern football, isn't it? I mean, it is. How many times are we going to talk about it? You know, some of the some of the kickoffs in 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 the uh, in the FA Cup again alienating fans just for monetary purposes, so it can be on TV and something like this. I mean, it doesn't shock me, Harry. It doesn't shock me. At all. Yeah, I I mean, when I first heard about it, I, I was I was furious. I was like, why are we going to risk players getting injuries in in a friendly with eight games to go? in the season. The most crucial time of the season is upon us and we're going and playing money spinning friendlies because that's what it is. It's a money spinner. I do wonder whether there's something to do with our sponsorship deal with Emirates that meant we had to go, that we had to play this game. Um, you know, there was a lot of support for Arsenal in the stadium. Mesut Ozil was treated like a god out there. And, and like you said, it is modern football, isn't it? And people will condemn it. People will criticise it. People will slag it off. But what I would say to those people is... If you claim to love the game of football, then you need to reevaluate the game that you're watching because you're obviously out of touch with it if you think that these things aren't going to happen. It's 2019. These things do happen. You do do your pre-seasons out in the Far East, in Australia, in America. You will have occasions where you do this kind of thing. This is part of the modern game. I think what we saw today as well, um, I mean, I, I, I know you didn't see the game, Mike. I, I watched it. The what's the word, the the reception that Mesa Ozil got was unbelievable. Every time he received the ball, the crowd were up on their feet cheering in anticipation. And what today proved is that giving Mesa Ozil 350 grand a week or whatever it is, is not actually that ridiculous. Because if you think of the commercial impact that and the popularity that this guy brings to this football club and the club's brand, then you can see why it's not such an outrageous decision. Am I saying that his performances are always where they need to be. No. Am I saying that he can improve? Uh, of course, he, he can improve. But what I will say is this proved that it's all about money. It's all about revenue. And, and to get, you know, that sort of reception in that part of the world in particular, you need to have someone like Mesut Ozil. Somebody made the point to me on Twitter earlier. It's because he's a Muslim and it was played in a Muslim country. Well, Shkodran Mustafi's a Muslim. But you didn't see the ground getting up and applauding him every time he got the ball. So for me, it's about Mesut Ozil's brand and how important that is to the club. Does his performances always warrant that sort of money? No. But obviously his his commercial uh, you know, status and marketability does warrant that kind of money. I don't know what you think of yeah, that. Yeah, ultimately that's what it's about, isn't it? I mean, the fact that uh, United spent £90 million on Paul Pogba, I mean, they probably made... Uh, a lot of that back in that in that opening video that they made when they did a brand deal with Adidas and uh, and Stormzy. So you know, even stuff like that before he'd even kicked a ball, they'd already made loads of money on shirt sales as well. So Urzel was an investment, and on that three hundred and fifty grand thing, I think we have to be careful because uh, people are saying you're paying him three hundred fifty grand a week. He's not playing. I don't think he would have got that if he wasn't playing. There must be some sort of clause in your contract to say that if you don't actually play or not actually travel to the squad. He probably got about half of that or I don't know, maybe a hundred and then the rest would, would be paid if he played. So I think people don't really know what goes on and they, they look at the headlines and they say 350 grand a week for not playing. How on earth can that happen? And you're right, fans and people need to get up to date with the modern game as it is. It's all about money. Like Arsenal as well. Like We've got one of the only owners, uh, I think, in the country sorry, in the Premier League that hasn't invested a penny of his own money because it's a self-sustaining business. He he puts money in um, um, at the beginning and then from there it makes its own money because of the TV money and transfer sales and revenue, all the streams of that. So I don't know why people are surprised at that and I don't know why 
they'd think that Arsenal wouldn't be chomping at the bit to get an opportunity to go abroad and get loads of money. On on Ozil as well, I mean, that guy that you mentioned sort of has a point. I mean, the fact that he's Muslim does play into it a bit. But again, it is because of the brand, not just not just because of that. But it, it does play a part. I mean, one of the reasons we signed Mohamed Elneny is because he appeals to a wider um, you know, Muslim background as well, doesn't he? So that will bring fans aboard, I think. Yeah, of course, it does play a part, but... It's not the only reason. I, what the point I'm trying to make is that there are lots of Muslim players at Arsenal Football Club, but Mesut Ozil's brand is bigger than all of those. That's just one factor, but he is a huge worldwide brand. The guy's got more followers on social media than Arsenal Football Club has, and by quite some distance as well. So uh, what I would say to people that complain about it all the time and say, you know, this the game's ruined and somebody else quoted my tweet earlier when I said that and said, this is everything that's wrong with modern football in one tweet. I agree with you. I agree that it's not ideal. I agree it's not the way I want to see the game go. But this is where we're at. And if people claim to love the game of football so much, then they need to stop being ignorant to the fact that this is the way the game is going and just get on... Get on with it. On Just accept it. I think I think people have a right to be upset, Harry, because it is becoming so sanitized now. I mean, can you imagine a team, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago going off for warm weather training in like I don't think Dubai even exists back then. I don't think half the buildings would have been there. And it is very sanitized. You know, the VAR coming in, you gotta check every single decision that the referee makes. I think it is going that way, but you're right. People have to accept it whether they like it or not. Yeah, that, that, that's just the way it's going, isn't it? But anyway, fortunately, that's all done now. Um, as far as we know, at the time of recording, there's no injuries, there's no problems, and the team will return uh, and get ready for Monday night's game. Imagine if there Newcastle. was, though. Can, can you imagine the outrage? Say say Lacazette had a, got a really bad injury, meant that he missed our most vital games of the season. Can you imagine just what how crazy people yeah, would have been going? I, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I kind of expected them to feature those players. The Lacazettes, the, the Ozil's, the Suarez's, the Mustafi's, Leno's. I expected them to feature because I thought if you're going over there for a money spinner, then these guys need to be in the public eye. That's the whole point of it. But I was really surprised that Ozil and Lacazette played 65 minutes each. I was really surprised at that. I didn't think they'd get more than a half. Um, but having said that, you know, we were losing 1-0. Um, we pulled one back right on the strike of half time through Carl Jenkinson. So it was finally balanced. And I guess Unai Emery didn't want to throw the game away. He didn't want to make too many changes. Uh, it was a game you, you were allowed to make 10 subs. Arsenal only had eight on the bench, whereas Al Nazir had 13 on the bench. Uh, so they made some wholesale changes as well. And, you know, it was pretty competitive in the first half, but the second half just, just became a bit of a, a bit of a farce, um, a bit of a, well, it was basically a, clearly a friendly and, and not that great to watch, to be honest. Arsenal ended up conceding the penalty as well uh, after Lacazette made it 3-1. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't a walk in the park is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, they gave us quite a tough time and, they are midway through their season. I think they're 11th in the uh, UAE Premier League. So they're not one of the top teams there. But, you know, it's the game of their lives, isn't it, for some of those players playing against the Premier League side. So uh, I get it. I get it. Let's talk about some of the international stuff now as well. Um, I know this is an Arsenal podcast, but we're going to touch on some of the key talking points from the international game because they're relevant at the moment. And it's something that, well, the first thing that I want to start off on is something that We've seen in the Premier League, we saw it at our own ground when a banana skin was was thrown at Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. And I want to touch on the racism that the England players suffered out in Montenegro uh, the other night. What can UEFA and the other governing bodies uh, in the game do to stamp this out? What can they actually do to prevent this from happening? Because it feels like they just throw fines at clubs, they throw stadium bans at them. And it doesn't seem to do anything. Is this a problem with society? And and if so, how can football play a part in changing that? I mean, I saw someone make the point uh, the other week, uh, one of my friends that works for Kick It Out, Harry, and they said um, Birmingham City recently got a nine-point deduction for breaking FFP rules, right? If they can get a deduction for that, why on earth would a player that's been racially abused not get a point deduction? I'm talking about club football now. If you move it to the international stage, um, 
some people saying that the Montenegro should be banned from international football uh, indefinitely. I mean, I don't know if I personally go that far, but I think there's not there's, there shouldn't be a limit on where we where we can take it with racism. Why is it there's a double standard? If something else happens, you know, as I was saying, FFP um, fans running onto the pitch and uh, beating up players like I did to to Jack Grealish. If there can be such severe punishments for that. Why is racism seen as less of an issue? I mean, what I really did like and why I think the landscape's slightly changing. Um, so it was Danny Rose and Raheem Sterling and Callum hudson Um, I think there was monkey chants um, were during the game at England against Montenegro. And they all came out and condemned it, which I don't think you'd see before. I think the players are very polished now. But Raheem Sterling was very honest and he said, look, we need to do something about this. And there, there needs to be banned. There needs to be a stadium ban. And if they're coming out and we're all having the conversation, I think that's slightly moving forward. But then, what, as you said, what the regulating bodies have to do is take that you know, step and say, actually, that um, if you continue this, then you won't be allowed to come to games. There has to be something that the, the regulating bodies can do that directly impacts those responsible and the country responsible that leads to the politicians maybe taking it seriously. Because for me, this is not a problem in football or a problem not exclusive to football, I should say. This is a problem in society. Um, And, you know, I've been to lots of countries and seen that happen. I've been to Cyprus, where we're from, and seen that happen. I've seen in club football players get racially abused. It's not right, but it happens in so many corners of the world. So what what I can't get my head around, and, and I guess it's a really difficult question and a really difficult job that UEFA, FIFA, and, and the FA, and whoever it may be, have on their hands, is what can they do that is serious enough to stop these people doing it but also doesn't impact the game and doesn't punish those who have just gone to watch a game of football. I mean, if we talk about Montenegro as an example, if you throw them out of the competition for the actions of 20, 30 people, is that fair? Is that going to... Is that going to solve the problem? Because those people are still not going to be educated. They're still going to be ignorant about the subject and nothing's really going to change. So I I guess that's kind of the million-dollar question, isn't it? What do you do... As a as as a, a national FA, as a UEFA representative, as a FIFA representative, what's the action that you need to take to make those responsible stop and get the country and the politicians to take responsibility for it? It's so difficult. It is a difficult one, and I, I think you're right. It is really harsh that a whole group have to be affected because of some stupid people's actions, but the only way that you stop them, as you said, is education. And when ed- education comes into it, I recently found out that um, that Kick It Out, uh, the England's uh, national you know, uh, body to tackling racism, they only get an annual budget of 100 grand a year. What on earth are they meant to do with that? How are they meant to fix this problem? Because what they do really good work, Harry, and I know a lot of people that work there, including one of the presenters I work with, Paul Mortimer, and uh, uh, he left... Um, recently, but um, when I actually looked into the budget and I saw what they can do, it's it's not a lot. So they're working with nothing basically, and they are the ones that are going round to to football academies and going round to clubs and they're talking to current players um, and they're trying to they're trying to help them and they're going out and talking to fans as well. And that is what needs to happen. But if they've got no money, then it needs to be taken higher up. And it needs to be government funded and it's not at the moment. And that's when you're right. And I think the reason these punishments are so harsh is because you need to um, have an effect to to cause the government to have another look. But you also need to have an effect to cause um, the people the money who are the, who are like Sky and stuff. If Sky see uh, a stadium not full, that's impacting their brand. And I think when it starts to come into money, that's when it actually might start to change because the whole world rolls around it. Yeah, absolutely. But I think also it's changing people's attitudes and and getting into certain cultures and trying to get them to understand the severity of it. For example, and I, I use Cyprus as an example only because I've been there and I've seen it firsthand. But I went to a game in Cyprus once. It was a club uh, a club fixture. And there was a black player who went to take a corner and he was racially abused. 
And I turned around to um, a guy I was with at the time and I said, well, that's out of order. And his response was, yeah, it is. But he wasn't shocked by it because in certain places, this is the norm. It happens all the time. So it's about changing that mentality about it. Yeah, you know, we don't condone it, but you know what? It happens. That, that, that carefree attitude needs to change. And it's so difficult culturally to get into those places and get those people to understand that. I think the, the tolerance levels of things like that here in the UK are, you know, so, so low. And that's right. That's how it should be. But in other countries, that's not the case. So you can do whatever you want in the stadium. You can ban fans. You can find them. You can deduct them points. But changing the actual mindset of the everyday football fan in certain countries is, is, in my opinion, an impossible task. And I don't think we'll ever fully... You say that, Harry, out. but we, we saw racism at, at Millwall recently. And that's, you know, a, a championship side. So it's not only just um, across countries, it's in, in our own country. And obviously, a, a Bamiyang for a, 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 a Spurs fan... But, for, that, for but that's Bionis the point, though. It's, when it happens here, it's a big deal. Yeah, when no, you're right. Here, you're it's right. a big deal, and well, ultimately, you can't you can't teach people who are ignorant. the The only thing you can do is really educate them on why using that sort of racist language, um, why it's so terrible, and probably people don't know, and they're brought up from a young age to say these things casually, but they don't actually know the meaning behind it. I mean, the the reason you know, in terms of we were talking about black people, they're oppressed, they were slaves for a long, long time, and someone who's just grown up in a family where they maybe say racist things, they don't know that. They, they just say the words because they repeat what's been said to them. So if you actually speak to them kids and you educate them from a young age and tell them, you know, the whole background behind why you can't say these things and why it was used as a symbol of oppression for all these years and the impacts of what you say to someone, it takes them back. That's, that's what you need to do. And it's a tough thing to do. But as I said, it won't happen without money. So someone needs to invest in it. Yeah, it certainly needs to be funded. It's a project that's certainly worth funding as well. Um, and when you think where some of the other money goes, uh, you do start to scratch your head and wonder why this is something, uh, you know, that, that can't be tackled. Now, I know we've already touched on on the trip to Montenegro, but let's, let's focus on the football, um, you know, the things that we all want to talk about and, and England performed really well, didn't they? They performed well on Friday and they performed well again in Montenegro. Gareth Southgate was an appointment that at the time I was, I turned my nose up at, I'll be honest. Um, but I think the the spirit that he's created and the team ethic he's created and, you know, the, the way he's put his arm around certain members of the group and got them working for him. I think England have improved a great, great deal. I think the World Cup for me, was a little bit of a red herring in the sense that I don't think England were as good as we thought they were. I think they had a bit of a, a decent run given the way the fixtures worked out. And that's why they got so far. But there was improvement, wasn't there? And what have you made of Gareth Southgate's uh, Lions? Because it's a completely different proposition to what we've seen uh, in recent years. And the buzz is back, isn't it? I mean, how many times did we watch England in the past, Harry, and we're just bored to death? I can remember not even wanting to watch England anymore, even at you know some some of the tournaments in the early stages. It was just so boring. And now what we're seeing is a dynamic side that has a great team ethic and they're fighting for places. And the best thing that Southgate has done is bring in the younger players. The, the, the good part of not having too many stars is that there's not too many egos, which plays into the fact that everyone has to fight for their place. I mean, you look at the team and really, like, what star players are there? Harry Kane, who is quite a laid-back character, he doesn't really seem like a like a guy who really fancies himself. Raheem Sterling is still quite young, but I'd say he's England's best player. But even then, you don't see him as a guy with a massive ego. Uh, he seems quite humble, doesn't he? So I think that's the the kind of foundation he's built the team around. Everyone fighting for their place, bringing in youth. I mean, the fact that they they played with. Um, with Jaden Sancho and Callum Hudson Odoi on the wings, you know, both 18 years old, uh, 36 b between them. That is just r ridiculous. I mean, wh when would you see that at an international level and especially at England and they're talented players? And that, that comes down to, to clubs as well. I think recently over the last few years, I think there have been some real good talents um, 
coming out of, uh, of of English clubs. And I think the fact that we have seen Sancho do so well in the Bundesliga, um, Reese Nelson's out there as well. Elmo Smith Rose out there hasn't played yet for Leipzig, I don't think. But the fact that they go, they're going out there and learning the trade and then coming back and doing so well is just a good good thing for the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is. You're right in saying that there's some really exciting talent there. I think that where perhaps England are lacking, if I'm going to be a bit critical, is I think in the centre of midfield, they don't have a what I would call a puppet master, a Luka Modric, that's going to pull the strings and get you going and make you tick. They've brought Declan Rice in. Um, you know, people like Phil Foden are coming through, but you don't really know what their level is yet because they've not done it consistently yet on, on the top stage. And that can be said of, of a lot of players in that squad, but... The future's bright for England. I agree with you when you say that Sterling is is the best player. I don't think there's any question about that. I think he's been magnificent. I think he's really taken his game up a notch uh, under Pep Guardiola. And, you know, people say that Guardiola's just one of these guys who's, who just gets given money and, and you know, of course he's going to win things. But the, the way he develops some players and the style of his football, you know, that isn't easy. That doesn't come uh, just by getting your checkbook out. So... Guardiola deserves immense credit for, for Sterling's uh, progression. But as does Sterling, because he's got his head down. He's been in the press for a lot of the wrong reasons. Um, in my opinion, as a player, he's done nothing wrong. I think he's been unfortunate to have been picked on by certain sections of the media um, for, for silly things and what I believe to be just racism, to be honest, undercover racism. Um, so, you know, credit to him. He's, he's done really, really well. And I think... You know, England have got this UEFA Nations League semi-finals coming up and it's a real chance, isn't it, for, for these young players to get the experience of playing knockout games. And, you know, if they go on and win it, I know it's only the UEFA Nations League, but imagine the confidence boost that will give uh, to the whole country and to the, those group of players going into Euro 2020. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it's all about, really. And the fact that um, I saw this stat, Callum hudson Odoi had made... Uh, had got a cap for England before he'd even started a game for his for his senior club in the Premier League. That's that's Chelsea because he's played as a sub. And you've got to think actually, like what on earth is Mauricio Sarri doing, having someone who can start for England in the first team but not get a game for his club? You you got to really question that. If I was a Chelsea fan, I'd be you know beside myself. Um, but it is a really exciting time and. Uh, as I said, the reason I think they're doing so well is because of the spirit. And when you compare that to like the golden generation and you had players like Lampard, Gerrard and Scholes and John Terry and Rio Ferdinand, yeah, they were a class team and they were great individuals, but as a team, they didn't work. It, it didn't work well together. Yeah, that's right. And I think Gareth Southgate um, has handled the media really, really well. And that's helped, doesn't it? Because it's for the first time you look at what the press are writing and you see a national press that are behind the team as opposed to a national press that are waiting to cut down the manager from his legs. And that's the difference for me. Does it help that Gareth Southgate's English? Absolutely, it does. Um, you know, people like Fabio Capello for me, uh, you know, and Sven Goran Eriksson before him, these kind of guys were always um, doomed to fail because it felt like anything they did was, was questioned. That Whereas Gareth Southgate's been given some time I think people have woken up to the fact that in actual in actual fact, England fell a long way behind some of the other footballing superpowers and they need some time to get back on the right track. But the signs are good and I think people are happy with that and willing to, to accept that it's going to take a little while longer. But England can become a force. Yeah, of course they can. And I think you'll see in this kind of... Um this thing across uh, across the nations that, you know, really promoting youth players, uh, it, it could become a problem later on, you know, when you're deep into a tournament like it did at the World Cup, when you just come up against the more experienced side. And it, it did happen against Croatia. And ultimately they, they dug in because there's that thing in football, you know, that you can't value experience enough. And what those players who have been there before, they can got overcome the emotion and pressure of the situation. But then we look at, at a nation who, you know, had an embarrassing World Cup, and that's Germany. And what, what Jürgi Löw has done is a real kind of last-ditch attempt to get them back to relevancy. And he's ditched all of the, uh, the 2010, 2000, um, not 2010, what was I thinking of? 2014, sorry, uh, World Cup winning team. And they're not good enough anymore. I think he dropped uh, Jerome Boateng, Mats Hummels, 
and Thomas Muller from the team. That's right, Which yeah. is a core. And he's brought in, uh, I think Serge Nambry started for them as a, like a false nine uh, against Never in their Scored 3-2 Scored a great winning. goal as well. Scored a fantastic <laughs> goal. And actually, I gave my little tweet where I was speaking about Nabry a few a few weeks ago, another plug, because um, I got a lot of stick about it. But I was like, why did we get rid of Serge Nabry and keep like Alex Iwobi and I got a lot of abuse for that but you know that was proved right but that's what Germany are doing they're bringing through youth players um, they've finally got over their over their bulk of um, of dropping uh, Leroy Sane and he's actually he's actually realised he's one of their best players and it's such a dynamic and young team and I think that's also what England are going for. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely the way to go now, isn't it? The Dutch are doing it as well and um, that was a great game, wasn't it, the other night between Germany and the Dutch. So, you know, it, youth is getting a real go now, particularly on the international scene. But going back to Arsenal for a minute, uh, there's been a lot of reports coming out uh, today and, and yesterday, I think, linking us with a potential move for Manchester United's Ander Herrera in the summer. He'll be available on a free transfer. What are your thoughts? Would that be a good signing? Uh, it's one that I'm not quite sure about. There are some positives and there are some negatives. But first of all, what, what are your thoughts? Well, it's just like I wrote an article recently, Harry, talking about, you know, what kind of market Arsenal are looking in. You're not looking at the M&S's or Waitrose. You're looking at the Lidl's and the Aldi's. You know, no disrespect to them. Um, but that's where you're looking. And if you're looking for, like, savvy signings on a free, I mean, Herrera could potentially be one. But does that excite me? No. Um, is he the kind of player that I think can improve us? No. I think he'd be probably fourth choice, to, to be honest with you, behind Xhaka, Torreira and Guendouzi. So I really don't see the point. And from a personal standpoint, I bloody hate Anderera. I think he's a he's a little shit, to be honest with you. And he got even worse when he was introduced to Jose Mourinho. I mean, th <laughs> those two together. Because I think... Um, Shit's houser, yeah, ex he's fine. <laughs> exactly. I think Anderera came in uh, from... I think it was Bill Bow. Um, or yeah I think it was Bilbao he came in he was like a number 10 and Mourinho turned him into basically a little rat yeah. and he just <laughs> winds people up and his face winds me up as well so from a footballing st standpoint not too impressed from a personal standpoint not impressed at all I mean I, I put a poll out again on the Chronicles of Aguna Twitter account earlier on today and, and it's still running this one because I've put it up for 24 hours there's 12 hours remaining at the time of recording 366 people have voted so far and the question was if Arsenal were to land Ander Herrera this summer on a free transfer would you be pleased and the response has been pretty much split down the middle 48% said yes they would be pleased and 52% said no for me I think I'm on the fence on this one at the moment I think it all depends, doesn't it, on what Arsenal can and can't spend in the summer. If you think of the positives and the Herrera's experience, he's, he's hardworking. He seems to be the kind of central midfield player that Unai Emery likes in the sense that he can play a bit, but he's also very dogged. He gets in and amongst people. Um, but on the, the negative side, it's kind of like we're taking a Manchester United cast off. And would that be giving the board a reason to say to Unai Emery, actually, you know, we don't really need to spend money on someone in that position because you've got Ander Herrera in. Is he better than Mohamed Elneny? Yes, I think he is. I think I'd rather have him than Elneny. And so it's an upgrade on Elneny. Guendouzi's still a little bit experienced for me, so he brings some much-needed experience in that area. But it's Ander Herrera, like you said, and I can't stand the bastard and I don't want to see him in an Arsenal shirt. And he is a little rat and it, it's all the things you said. So I'm really torn on this one. But some of the responses, you know, uh, this one comes from at umpteen the Gooner on Twitter. He says, no, we don't need him. Um, Arsenal analysis says he's a United reject. Carlito says tired of Arsenal signing Man United's rejects. The only one I'd make an exception for is Eric Bailly. Um... Uh, this one comes from at half Ecuador. He says, Arsenal keep relying on free transfers. If they want to win trophies, they need to sign top players. Uh, Amir Zeb says, if he wants 50K max as a wage, uh, then it's okay. But anything higher is not acceptable. So people are not, uh, you know, obviously most of the comments are negative ones, but in terms of the poll, it's split down the middle and it'll be interesting to see how this one develops. I think it's just the, I don't think there's a story there. I think it's just too convenient of a link to make at the moment. Arsenal need to strengthen. Arsenal don't really have that much money. But from what we know, 
United are looking to offload him, it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I think we're pretty much going to be linked with any free agent, Harry, because people have seen that 50 million fee that we've reportedly got, which really is not in context because we're going to be getting a lot of player sales this summer. Um, you know, we'll have a big boost if we finish in the Champions League. We'll get an extra 30 million from that. So people need to think about where uh, what that sum will actually be. But it is true that we are shopping in the mid-range market. Um, we won't be able to uh, sign a player more than like 30 million maybe. So that is the sort of thing that we should be doing, picking up savvy moves. Um, like, And I mean... You know, I wouldn't necessarily be upset if we sign Herrera because at the end of the day, it's a free transfer. The only thing is, if that's taken away, you know, an 80 grand from the wage bill, then you have to you have to really weigh that up. Is it worth it? Is it worth taking off an extra 80 grand that you might spend on the players of bringing that will actually get into our first team or challenge against the first team? And that, that's what you have to think about. Um, in terms of transfers this summer, I think we really need a defender centre back as we all know I looked at someone who could potentially be on the way up um, Kostas Manolas who's a Greek and I would love to see him as a pairing with uh, Socrates at the back if we have to break the bank to get him you know we, we have to you know I, I think we could probably in the region of 30 40 million but I'd much rather spend that money on somewhere we really really need it like that yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. And there is a lot of positions that need addressing at Arsenal and that, that's just a, a, another one of them. So we'll have to see how that develops, of course. Uh, right, that brings us to the end of another podcast. Thank you once again for tuning in. My thanks to Mike uh, and, of course, to Harry DeCosimo, who joined us on the phone earlier on. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. Subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on iTunes, leave us a review and check out our website, which has had a bit of a makeover. It's www.chroniclesafc.com. Uh, yeah, that's right. Chroniclesafc.com. Confuse myself there. Uh, we'll be back next week, uh, Tuesday. Tuesday evening, we'll be looking at the uh, Newcastle United game and uh, yeah, getting back to our normal schedule. Uh, well, as close to it as we possibly can. Until then, guys, take care of yourselves and uh, ciao.